Welcome to the How Dentists Get Paid podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grant, and I have spent my entire adult life in the dental field. I'm excited to be interviewing dental industry leaders and innovators to learn their best tips and practices for success in the dental field. So whether you're a new dentist fresh out of dental school or a veteran provider with roadblocks ahead of you, this podcast is for you. So let's jump right in with our guest speaker and explore how dentists get paid. Welcome um, to Ask the Intodontist Live Q&A. Today, I'm really excited to introduce our expert endodontist, who is Dr. Prashant Burma. He is also a part-time clinical assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Dentistry, the Division of Endodontics. Um, he was a former assistant professor of restorative dentistry at the University of Pacific Dental School in San Francisco. So teaching is obviously his jam. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Rachel. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to have you. And thank you so much for blocking out some of your time today after seeing patients. I'm sure it's been a long, busy day. So we are very honored to have this time with you. So I want to go ahead My and pleasure. get started and um, have you introduce yourself. Let's hear just a little bit about your journey in the uh, dental field and more specifically, you know, why you got into the endodontic specialty. So uh, I'm an endodontist, teach part time, as you said. Um, I, you know, the most likely reason why I got into dentistry is because both my parents are dentists. Uh, that was the initial initial push to get into dentistry. And then after I'd done dental school, you know, I, I wanted to practice general dentistry for a while because I did like endo at that time, but I wasn't sure that I just wanted to do endo only every day, all day, every day. I didn't, I didn't know that. So I decided to do general dentistry for a while. I practiced as a general dentist for a few years. Uh, I used to practice in John, downtown San Francisco. Um, and then after I'd got my fill of general dentistry and, you know, I, I still realized that endo was what I liked best and you know, what, I, what I was best at. So I decided to specialize. And then I went to a residency program, moved, moved across the country with my family, moved to the East Coast to the University of Maryland, uh, where I went to a three year residency program with the intention that I would move back to California. But then during those three years of residency, you know, life life changed and my wife liked the area. I got a good opportunity. So I decided to stay on the East Coast. And so I've been on the East Coast since that time. And then I've been in prior practice as an endonist since I finished my residency about six, seven years ago. Wow, what a journey. And it's kind of cool that it all caused that relocation and just where you were meant to be, right? Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So um, what is one thing that you do in your practice daily that you couldn't live without? Uh, if I had to pick just one thing, I, I like to track how my practice is doing. That means looking at uh, a daily summary of what the numbers were for the prior day. The way I get that is through a report that I get from eAssist. But I mean, every practice management software has this ability to pull out a report and you can go through that report, see how you're doing. So that's what I can live without. That's how I start my day. I, I look at uh, I look at the report to see how yesterday was. Yeah, so I mean like a health analysis of the practice, kind of just checking in to see what that lifeline is, is looking like. Um, yes. So I'm curious, you know, it, that's pretty powerful that that's something that you couldn't live without on a daily basis. What uh, specific things are you looking for or, um, you know, for anyone that is maybe starting up a practice or kind of um, navigating, learning, looking at their reports and what's important and what to focus on? What would be your advice in that perspective? Um, the, I guess the three biggest numbers I'm looking at is what was the production for the day? Uh, what was the adjusted production for the day? And what were the net collections for the day? So production gives me a you know very clear sense of how many patients were seen, how many procedures were done. Um, adjusted production gives me a sense for how much we are writing off for insurance adjustments, which is always a higher percentage than we would like. And then uh, collections gives me a sense for how the cash flow is for the practice. So those are those are the three biggest numbers I'd, I'd say I'd, I look at on the report. And I mean, I have a sense of if the numbers reconcile, 
uh, with other reports that my my staff is giving me i mean they'll give me a report for how much was processed through credit cards how much was processed through insurance checks so i can i can easily understand if my daily report reconciles with what my staff is giving me yeah. right and having that peace of mind is always nice too so then you can focus on that treatment yeah. that's really great now obviously we've had a last uh that's last year was super rough um especially on our industry and practices i'm curious in owning a specialty practice um given the last rough year that we have had what is the goal or have you had to adjust setting goals for this upcoming year and and what does that kind of look like um Certainly, you know, last year was a difficult year in, in many ways. Uh, but overall, when we look at the whole year, uh, my practice has done fairly well. We have grown compared to 2019, for example. Uh, there, was a, there was a period in that first wave of the pandemic in April and May when, you know, we are a referral-based specialist practice. So all my referrals, my general dentist referrals, everyone was closed. So, uh, of course, that led to our patient volume dramatically uh, decreasing. Uh, we stayed open throughout the pandemic. Uh, I mean, as an endodontist, I see emergencies every day. And so even during that first wave, we were always open. We were here every single day uh, at lower capacity, but we were still here. We always had emergency patients every day. Uh, but the volume and the collections had certainly uh, taken, a, had taken a big hit. But we recovered from that, and uh, you know, again, as we look at the year as a whole, we've grown as compared to 2019. So you know, it's been it's been a mixed bag. Sure, sure. Well, it's a blessing to be growing, you know, especially with some of those roadblocks that that last year has thrown at us. So I mean, that's definitely a great thing. Um, and I and I wanted to ask, you know, talking about being open the whole time, especially you know, th this is somewhere that if their general practitioner is not open and they've got a toothache, it's one that's throbbing and heat cold sensitive and they need to get in and get seen. I mean, there is a huge resource other than the emergency room, which is just going to try to sedate and medicate, you know, put a bandaid on. So it was nice, I'm sure, as an added resource for patients that are sitting home, eating a lot more junk, probably not taking care of themselves and have a specialist in the Donna's open when maybe their general offices weren't. Did you see maybe, um, a higher influx of those types of patients in your practice? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw changes in the pattern of our practice in, in you know, the types of emergencies that we were seeing. We were seeing patients who had um, tried to stay home in the initial stages of feeling a toothache, and then it had gotten to the point of being intolerable. And that's when they they were looking and perhaps calling their dentist and their dentist was telling them i'm closed but i have this colleague who's open go see them so we were seeing a lot of that uh, we were seeing patients traveling from further distances than usual to come to see us uh, we were seeing a, a lot of patients who had been you know to an emergency room and been redirected to come and see us Actually, we're now part of a, a research project with the National Dental Practice Space Research Network to document these changes in practice patterns and during the, uh, the first wave of the pandemic. So you bring up a very good point. This, is, this, is, uh, this has been what we're talking about with, uh, with the NDP by PBRN the last few weeks. Wow, that's really interesting. Now, I'm curious, you know, being that you were kind of a resource in some of those areas, how did you stimulate your name as far as into the community marketing your practice so that they did know that there was a, a person to go to you know when all of this did hit um you know my community is really my local general dentist uh, that's who i focus on keeping close contact with and maintaining good relationships with so um you know we were in contact with them throughout and they knew that our office was open so they would direct their emergency patients to us. Uh, and you know, that was probably the main way. We didn't really uh, go to places like emergency rooms and, and let them know. Uh, we just got the word out through our referring dentists, through the local general dentists. 
That's great. I mean, that must say a lot just in the involvement you have, you know, in that community relationship and building that trust with your general uh, providers. Um, and when we're talking about that with anyone that's listening in, what would be um, maybe your best advice, you know, where we're at currently in our um, state of the pandemic and kind of the changes we've been able to adapt and bring into the practice? What would maybe be your um kind of roadmap for success advice for any of our doctors listening, whether they're in a general practice, because I know you have that experience before, you know, specializing in, spe, uh, specializing in endo, um, or even if they are, you know, working specifically in an endo practice. Um, I think being, having perseverance, you know, many of us have the the right path that we've chosen. We've chosen to do the right thing for the right reasons. And it takes time. It takes time. So once we've chosen how we like to practice, we've found our niche, we've found where we want to practice, and we've decided what our practice is going to generally look like in terms of the demographics of the community we're going to serve. Are we going to be a, a high volume, uh, every insurance type of practice, or are we going to be a lower volume, more out of network type of practice? We've decided that. We've made our vision. I think we have to really commit to that and give it the time that it takes to see that come to success. There's so many different paths to success in dentistry, uh, but uh, all of them take time. So it just finding your vision and staying committed to it for the long haul, uh, I think is what I, what I would suggest. That's great. You know, I think a trending uh, comment of suggestion or, or advice is doing the right thing for the right reason, you know, for all of our speakers that we've had for this event. And I, I think that's really mon monumental because everything else just seems to fall in place when you when you do that and sticking through and persevering, just like you said, you know, that's really the biggest takeaway. That's great. Now, um, when it comes to advising general dentists on how to cultivate, you know, on that mutual beneficial relationship with an endodontist, um, what would you say are kind of some tips and tricks to really building that network? Um, so in, in your local community as a general dentist, you're going to have specialists reaching out to you and uh, attempting to initiate a relationship with you. And then once you decide that you're going to give a certain person a chance and you're going to try to develop a relationship, a collaborative relationship with them, then I think you really have to uh, give it a certain period of time. You have to understand that you have to judge your specialist or an endodontist specifically by their body of work over a reasonable period of time, say six months to 12 months. Uh, so you can see the post-operative reports that you get from them. You can see the quality of work that they do in, in, in a more holistic way, not just in one or two selected cases. Uh, and also you get to see those patients back. So those patients will come back to the general dentist for the crown and perhaps for follow-ups later. And then you'll hear some feedback. You'll, you'll hear either positive feedback or negative feedback. So it takes that period of time, about six to 12 months, to really uh, understand whether this is someone that you can have a long-term, collaborative, mutually beneficial relationship with. Uh, I think those that uh, those that give it that reasonable period of time and really commit um, to you know, building such a relationship, they see a career-long rewards. Yeah. We, we've been working with some dentists now for many, many years, and we, we hope to continue working with them for their entire career. So uh, that's really that's really the goal. For a referral-based practice, that really is the goal. Yeah. Now, do you utilize, um, I know, obviously, after you complete your treatment, then they go back, they have that build-up crown or whatever is needed, you know, post uh, seeing you. Do you have that uh, fluid relationship with the provider post-treatment, or does it kind of stop once services, you know, have ended for that, that need? You mean my relationship with the dentist post treatment? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Check. You know, as far as any kind of contact with them, following up. You know, post treatment. Yes. So, in the initial stages of my in my relationship with the dentist, usually there is a lot of contact. Uh, we are talking about cases frequently. We are talking about you know their expectations for how I should uh, temporize the case, for example, or what my follow up 
uh, you know, uh, regimen is going to be. So in the initial stages, there's a lot of contact. There's phone calls, there's emails, there's even text messages. So uh, over time, usually by about the one year period, we've gotten to know each other well enough uh, that really the only contact is uh, email reports. So I'm sending them a post-op report and they've, they're looking at a situation which they've seen 20 times before. Uh, they know what I'm delivering and they know that it's consistent. So we are mostly communicating through post-operative reports and you know, through patients. So patients who come back to them are giving them good feedback. Their patients who uh, come back to us, say, for a different procedure on the same tooth or for another tooth, they communicate between. So it's it's via patients in after a while. Right. Well, and it sounds like you really build that relationship from the start, and then you can kind of collaborate and cultivate with the doctor. And ultimately, that shows in that patient relationship and their feedback of their experience. Because you can really tell when two doctors aren't communicating and they have conflicting you know, treatment plans or whatever that may be. So I know it probably is reassuring to the patient when that's all in alignment. And patients can tell. Uh, patients can tell when there is a smooth relationship between a general dentist and a specialist. So uh, absolutely, you know, they, they, they need to feel that. Uh, the, often the patient that's in my chair who I'm seeing for the first time and they're here for a root canal and they're in pain, the reason that they're trusting me is because their dentist told them, this guy is good, go see him and trust him. So uh, I'm piggybacking off that, off that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to go back to the days that I was personally in a practice. And I can remember, I'm sure a lot of practices are like this, where you have the closet or the drawer and you have the book of referring pamphlets and they have the map of where the office is and you can kind of get some information, the tooth number, you know, that kind of thing. Is there a way um, that you have found to kind of stand out amongst those packets and who those doctors are picking, you know, obviously building that relationship communication wise, but really kind of even before that from the very start so that you're the one that they pick. Uh, you know, in the initial stages, again, I have to put in time and effort on a one-on-one -on -one basis to build that relationship. But after a while, what I find is often once the doctor has, has, has reached the point of trust in me and my practice, then they are handing it off to their staff. Uh, and the staff is the one, the front desk is the one that's actually fishing through the packets, mm -hmm. and looking for uh, my referral pad and filling it out. So I try to make it easy for them. Uh, I mean, for example, you know, my front desk knows their front desk and it's easy for them to communicate with each other. You know, they can just send over an, a quick email with the patient's name and x-rays, for example, and that's all that's needed and we'll take it from there. They don't have to fish through those packets. Um, you know, they know each other. And also, you know, sometimes their referral pads have run out. So, I mean, we have we have it online on our website. They can just download the referral pad or send an online referral. So we try to make it easy for the staff so the logistics are not an issue. They don't have to fish through a bunch of referral pads. They they know who, you know, who is responsive and they, they can easily get the patient seen. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that was going to be my next question is, it, do you find that it's more convenient and do you recommend that kind of direct schedule contact so that it's not up to the patient to call the office, to get themselves scheduled, to give over the insurance information, trying to make it just as convenient as possible. So all they have to do is get to your location and get that treatment, you know, uh, rendered. Yes. Absolutely, it is more convenient. And for emergency patients, we have offices doing that uh, regularly, uh, almost once a day. Uh, so if a dentist has a patient in the chair who's in severe pain and needs to be seen the same day by us, so the dentist front desk will call us and we'll set up a time and we'll just tell the patient to go here and be there at this time. So uh, absolutely, that is the more convenient way for it to be done, especially for people who want to be seen same day. Right. Right. Well, and especially being in the specialty that you are, because I mean, that sense of urgency, that sense of pain and getting at least some kind of pain release um, is so important. So it's really nice to have that convenience to give that kind of buy in investment to the patient. because They just want to get out of pain and you've been friendly enough there to serve them, there to help them. You know, it, 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 I'm sure it's very reassuring as a patient as well. Yeah. 
So I'm sure everyone is getting some great takeaways of things that they're not already implementing that they can in their practice. I just want to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, now's going to be a great time um, before we get to the end of our panel today to put that into the chat so that we can um, give some Q&A time here at the end. Now, doctor, I want to, I know we've talked about a lot of positive things, some things that really kind of take the practice to the next level and, and, journey, and things that you've done throughout your journey. I want to shift focus and just kind of experience maybe some of the growing points or the pain points that you have um, walked through or made while building and growing your practice that you would caution other endodontists to kind of avoid and learn from those mistakes. Um, in terms of growing an endodontic practice, you know, uh, the, the biggest issue for, for us for growth was, you know, was doctor capacity. Endodontics, the doctor is directly delivering the entire procedure. So I have to be there in the room and I have to treat that patient and it takes me uh, 60, 90 minutes, sometimes a little more, but I, I am delivering that procedure for that entire length of time. So as our referral relationships grow, our referral network grows and our patient flow grows, uh, we hit a ceiling in terms of how many procedures I can do uh, per day. And then we are looking at bringing in other doctors and growing from a solo practice to a two-person practice and then a group practice. So um, I think that that was my my biggest growing pain. And then as we are doing that, you know, we make some assumptions because we are uh, we are we're thinking like you know we're thinking like our training is similar to other people's training. So, for example, when I hired my first associate, I made the assumption that uh, just because a person is a board certified endodontist means that he is immediately capable of working independently in one of our offices, uh, which turned out to not be the case. And you know, I learned from that experience that no matter what a person's uh, background or experience really, when you bring someone new into your practice, you have to be prepared for an fairly intense initial period of mentoring that person and integrating that person into your practice culture and the, the way that the practice runs and flows. That's how you can you know, make them successful. And the only way in an endodontic practice to grow is to uh, eventually add doctors. And then you have to add the right doctors and you have to make those doctors successful so that was the growing pain for me. That, that's what I would suggest to other doctors, other endodontists specifically, right. specifically looking to grow. So, and I'm curious, through that process, had, did you find that you created kind of a standard operating um, procedure or protocol when, you know, mentoring those doctors so that you could, you know, implement that growth at a steady pace? Or what, what did you find to be successful, you know, after figuring out that that was a pain point and overcoming it? Um, what what takeaways did you have that you won't do without, you know, moving forward? Uh, yes, there is. A, 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 we have a, a manual. We wrote a manual for, you know, a new person joining us to, to get them acclimated to how we work. But also, you know, especially working with doctors, everyone is different. And it's hard to um, it's hard to imagine their their interactions and their job description as you would for a for programming a robot for example you could write an algorithm and they would just follow it but they, they're it's not like that with, yeah. <laughs> with doctors right so uh, the teaching has to be customized so um even though i have the manual i, I find myself spending a lot of time one-on-one -on -one custom teaching to what this person needs and how i can address their specific needs so it's a, it's a time consuming process, but it really is the only way in an endodontic practice that I know of to grow the practice. Yeah. And you really have to wear a lot of hats, right? Business owner, business leader, teacher, mentor, coach, therapist, I'm sure at some point, <laughs> dentist. I, I mean, try not to think about it that way. It, it just keeps growing. Keep growing. I need do what I need to do and move, move, keep moving. <laughs> right. Well, and it's always nice. I mean, when you have the passion, everything else just kind of comes naturally, you know, and, and replicating yourself 
to a way that someone else can adhere that learning, you know, pattern and style. So, I mean, it's definitely an art, just kind of like dentistry. So it's, it's great to have that vision to grow, but then to be able to execute it the way that you have to, I'm sure a lot of us can learn from, you know, just all of those takeaways. I'm learning every day. I mean, I, I, I've, like I shared, I, I've made plenty of mistakes. So I've learned and every year we learn from our mistakes in the prior year. Absolutely. So given what you know now, um, again, I'm just kind of kind of circle back. If you were talking to Dr. Burma when he was graduating school and you had to say, listen here, this is what I've learned. Don't make this mistake or this is what you need to implement from the start. What would you tell your younger self? Uh, I mean, I, I'd say look at your career as, as a marathon, not not a sprint. Um, and and if, again, if you do the right thing for the right reasons, success will come with time. Just be be patient and persevere at what you're doing. Don't be in a rush. You know, uh, it it will come. Live a balanced life. You know, I I think that in the initial phases of growing the practice as a business owner specifically, you're you're dedicating every hour of every day to this. But uh, you know, it's important to preserve some balance in your life to, to stay sane and understand that you'll be doing this for 30 years, not just five years. So having that balance and not being in a rush, I think that's what I tell myself. Yeah. Back. <laughs> yeah. Flow and steady wins the race, right? Yeah. It takes that time. Well, that's really powerful. Um, I always like to ask, is there any questions that if you were listening today, do you think that we haven't covered or is important to go over for any of our listeners? Um, I, I think, you know, uh, perhaps having each person's vision of their practice, because dentistry has so many different types of practices, right? Some people have built their practice as a, as a high volume insurance based practice, and there's things to learn from how they've built it that way. And some people have seen success in being a, a lower volume, higher fee, more out of network type of practice. So it's always interesting to me when I talk to two successful dentists who have so different practices, their practices are totally different, but both are successful. Both are successful. So there's many paths to achieving success. And I think that's what I enjoy learning from each dentist, what their particular vision was and how they came to you know, achieve success in that framework. Right. And I think that collaboration aspect of it, because they, each doctor is so individual and has so uh, many different little nuggets of important information to share, that that intercommunication and that community is really stronger when you guys are supporting each other and kind of going off of this is what I've seen work well, and this is what has, hasn't worked well, you know, type of treatment plan progression. Yeah. So I definitely can relate for sure. Well, again, I just want to thank you. I know I have learned a lot. I believe that our um, our listeners have also learned a lot. So hopefully they feel more empowered to either build into that uh, endodontic pathway of their practice or, you know, whether it's bringing on a new uh, doctor in their general practice and kind of what that looks like. So thank you again for your time. Um, I genuinely appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and bring up the course code for anyone that's listening so then you can have that information here let me just bring that up on my screen for everyone you're with me here let's see all right so we have that course code is hwd i'm seeing a question in the private chat all right, I could take a look at that real quick. Uh, real quick, that code is HWDI14, course completion code 070. And then let's take a look and see if we have another question. So we do, um, Doctor, what um, do you do to set yourself apart from the competition when it comes to getting referrals from general practitioners? Uh, I'd, say, I'd say a couple things are the most important for my practice. Uh, one is clinical quality and consistent clinical quality. Our, our referrals have 
come to expect it from us that when we are sending them a case, sending back the case that it will uh, it will be a, a high quality outcome and it will look a certain way on their post operative x rays they will have predictability when they restore that case so uh, that's the that's i think the first and the second is availability you know in endodontics emergencies are a, are a big part of our practice and uh, there's we have a policy in our practice that any patient that is in that is in pain is going to be seen same day or is going to at least be offered the option of being seen the same day and we will fit them into our schedule so we will get them out of pain in many cases we can complete the treatment but in many cases we get them out of pain and we have them return on a different day to complete the treatment but we offer that to our referrals that if they have a patient in the chair who's in pain, we will see that patient that same day. So those are the two things I think have, have helped us to grow the practice, you know, consistent clinical quality and emergency availability. All right, doctor. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. I was so excited to be able to host this panel with you today. My inner dental nerd is just jumping up and down inside to be able to pick your brain. So again, thank you for your time. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank so you thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. This podcast is sponsored by eAssist Dental Solutions. eAssist helps dentists collect 100% of what dentists are owed by insurance companies. Their dental billing experts work with dentists and their teams to ensure the claim submission process is smooth and that dentists and their staff can focus on patient care. If you or someone you know is in need of assistance with the dental billing process, call 1-844-E-ASSIST or visit dentalbilling.com to find out more.